very good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the ISS book discussion on a new Cold War, Harry Kissinger and the Rise of China. This collective monograph was recently published by Harper Collins Publisher earlier in August to mark the 50th anniversary of Kissinger's historic flight to Beijing in 1971. If you're interested to purchase a copy of the book, do look out for the QR code and link, which will be shared before the end of the event. We will also send you an email separately with the purchase details. Before we proceed with the event, I'll appreciate if you could mute your videos and microphones throughout the session. If you have any questions to share with the panelists, please forward them via the Zoom chat. We will consolidate your questions for them to answer during Q&A time. This afternoon, we are delighted to have with us five distinguished speakers to share thoughts on their contributions to the book. The speakers are Dr. Sanjaya Baru, Distinguished Fellow at United Service Institution of India, followed by Mr. Rahul Sharma, former newspaper editor. And we also have Dr. Tanvi Madan, Senior Fellow and Director of the India Project, Brooklyn's Institution in Washington, DC. Follow up, we have Dr. Aisha Siddika, Research Associate at SOAS South Asia Institute in United Kingdom. Our last speaker is Mr. Peter Varhees, the Chancellor of the University of Queensland, Australia. Moderating today's session will be Professor Raja Mohan, the Director of ISS. I now invite Professor Mohan to give his introduction remarks. Professor, please. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Let me welcome everyone for this uh, book discussion uh, this afternoon. Uh, we have a very, very uh, interesting uh, book uh, under review today. Uh, it is called Henry Kissinger and the Rise of China. Uh, the two editors of the book, uh, Dr. Sanjay Baru and Rahul Sharma, are here with us uh, to, uh, to talk about the book. Uh, we also have uh, three chapter contributors. Uh, that is uh, Dr. Tanvi Madan, Dr. Aisha Siddika and uh, Ambassador Peter Vergis uh, to talk, to give their perspectives uh, on this uh, very uh, important theme. Uh, 50 years ago, uh, last month, uh, Henry Kissinger's visit to China uh, dramatically altered the, the structure of uh, the geopolitics of Asia and the world. And since then, much has happened between US and China. Uh, and today we see a, a US-China alignment against the Soviet Union in the 70s turn into a Cold War between uh, US and China. So this is probably uh, a, 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 a very fascinating uh, evolution of uh, international relations in Asia over the last uh, five decades. And uh, there are many things to talk about it. So what we're going to do now uh, is to have the two editors first, uh, uh, Sanjay and uh, Rahul, to talk about the book, each one for about seven to eight minutes. Uh, then I'll go to the to the chapter contributors. Uh, that is starting with uh, Tanvi, then Aisha, uh, then Peter, and uh, since I'm a chapter contributor too, so maybe I'll speak uh, after the three of them, and then we have enough time uh, for about uh, 35 minutes of, of uh, interactive discussion with uh, with the audience uh, here. So please don't wait till the uh, conversation by the panelists is over. Please keep sending in your questions, and Claudia will. Uh, channel those questions uh, to me. But uh, to each one of our speakers, uh, let's try and stay with uh, seven to eight minutes uh, so that we have enough time uh, for a for a good discussion uh, at the at the end of it. So I won't say anything at this point, maybe a couple of things uh, when we wrap up. So let me start by uh, going to Sanjay. Sanjay, you want to kick off the discussion today? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Raja. Uh, I must first begin with a few thank yous. First, thank you to the Institute of South Asian Studies, uh, ISAS Singapore, and to you personally, uh, Raja, for hosting uh, this discussion. Uh, and thank you to my co-authors, uh, who are uh, three of whom have joined us, um, Mr. Varghese, Dr. Madan, and Dr. Siddika. Um, and I also I sh should mention at the very beginning that the idea of putting this book together came, in fact, from my colleague, Rahul Sharma, Less than a year ago, we were sitting and having a chat and he said to me that, why don't we put together a set of essays looking back at 50 years of US-China relations? Uh, because 71 is, uh, 
2021 is going to come and it will be the 50th anniversary of 1971. And that was when, you know, we, many of us uh, were reading stuff about the new Cold War and the growing tension between the uh, US and China. And, and there were many in the US uh, like Dr. Kissinger uh, who were urging the two countries uh, to kind of manage the relationship better and, and not uh, slip into a second Cold War. So we thought that this was a good time to take stock. Um, and then we sat down and drew up a list of uh, writers. And very fortunately for us, uh, each one of the persons we wrote to uh, responded uh, almost uh, instantly and agreed to write, contribute these essays. So we have a you know, wonderful set of essays. This is the, the book here. And I have colleagues from uh, different parts of the world, Teresita Schaefer and Tanvi from the US. Um, Mr. Vargis from Australia, Mr. Kikuchi from Japan, Frederick Grar from France, um, Bill Emmett from the UK, Chungmin Lee from South Korea, um, and several uh, friends of ours from India, Sujan Chinoy, um, Suhasini Haider, Samir Saran, and of course, Raja, who is now in Singapore. Um, so we have, you know, we tried to put together a set of essays that offers a diverse perspective, a European perspective, an American perspective, uh, an, an Asia Pacific perspective or Indo-Pacific perspective. If you look. I think the only part of the world uh, which may have been affected uh, by these changes that, uh, um, incidentally, we have two uh, others from Singapore. I must, should mention Kishore, my friend Kishore Maibubani uh, from Singapore, who has an essay as well as uh, young Boone from the RSIS, uh, also who has an essay. So two Singaporeans have also contributed to this book. Uh, I think the one region, as I said, which uh, doesn't get adequate uh, representation is probably Central Asia. Uh, we couldn't really identify anyone from, from that part of Asia. Um, so the book itself has three different kinds of essays in it. I think one set of essays um, look at the event itself um, and take the view, in fact, most of them, whether it's Tezi Schaefer or Bill Emmert or Rana Mithar, who's based in London, um, that it was inevitable. Uh, what had happened had to happen. If not now, a little earlier, Rana Mithar says that there were uh, missed opportunities before 71, when US and China uh, could have actually established diplomatic relations. In any case, the, the, the event of 1971 uh, was waiting to happen. Um, and, and, and therefore, uh, it was uh, not something that you know, was as dramatic as might appear. Um, then a second set of essays, of course, look at the consequences. The, even those who, who believe the event was inevitable also look at the consequences of, of the event, uh, both the geopolitical and the geoeconomic consequences. A third set of essays look at the impact of the US-China reconciliation or, or reset uh, on their part of the world, Australia, or South Korea, Japan, um, Singapore, um, Europe, um, you know, kind of regional perspective on how this affected different parts of the world. Um, in my own essay, which I will uh, take a couple of minutes to briefly mention, um, I don't look actually at 1971, uh, but I argue that you know, if you look at the 50 years, the turning point was the Tiananmen Square incident. And the period from 71 till the Tiananmen Square incident was a period in which the focus was essentially on you know, the Cold War, the, so, the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, which happened in 91, and Tiananmen happened in 89. So that phase was a phase where geopolitics, uh, in a sense, was more important. But after 91, once the Cold War ended, the focus shifts to business and economics. And so what I call a phase of geoeconomics. And there I, I uh, look very closely at the role of Henry Kissinger from, who moves from being a diplomat to a lobbyist, uh, to lobbying for American business and actively canvassing for China's membership of the World Trade Organization, actively canvassing for a move from uh, the PNTR, the permanent normal, um, the, the normal trade relationship uh, to, being granted to China and, and the, the role of American business lobbies. And this is you know, very much an Indian perspective. 
because in India, that was a period in which the US had, had very little interest in India. All the investment, in fact, whether from the US or from Japan or from Europe, were all going towards China. Uh, and China became the economic magnet that sucked in the, 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 the Western democracies. And so um, I look at Kissinger's uh, very individual role that of Kissinger Associates uh, in promoting China uh, as a destination and, and building the base for what then uh, consequently happened, which was the geoeconomic rise of China and, and the, um, the, the, the foundations for the current crisis, or at least the crisis that Donald Trump uh, sought, sought to manage, which was the deindustrialization of the United States of America. Uh, the deindustrialization of the US was a consequence of, was a result of many factors, but certainly the trade relationship with China was a central factor that contributed to the deindustrialization of the United States. And, and, and uh, um, you know, the kind of trade policy that the US has been pursuing both under the previous president and now under President Biden, uh, the much more inward looking trade policy, uh, which is aimed at hurting China, but you know, hurting many other countries as well. That is the focus of my own chapter. I have uh, exhausted my seven minutes, Raja, but uh, I can come back and say a little more about the book and about my chapter. But at this stage, let me stop there. Thanks, uh, thanks, Sanjay. That was a good bar for the rest of us to, to follow. Uh, let me now invite Rahul. Uh, Rahul, you want to take over? Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Raja. And you know, thank you for setting this up. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the idea was actually, I mean, like uh, uh, like Sanjay said, you know, we were sitting and chatting and you know, Kissinger, uh, you know, history produces individuals and every decade also has some years which are very interesting to look back to and learn. So I think 1970s, if we look at that decade, 1971 was a critical year uh, when, you know, this visit happened. Uh, there was the treaty between India and Soviet Union, which we were talking about before we started uh, the, the session. Uh, then, of course, it followed by the dismemberment of Pakistan and the creation of East Pakistan. 73, we had the oil crisis, and 79 was another very critical year for, for the world, especially for the Islamic world, because that was the year when there was an attack on Mecca, there was uh, the overthrow of the Shah, and then, you know, eventually, uh, the Soviet troops came into Afghanistan in the end of 79. But if we go back to 71, I think a lot of it, uh, and you know, I agree with Sanjay that till 89, it was more geopolitics than it became geoeconomics. But Kissinger is, is, is there in the background uh, for a long time, despite the fact that uh, he was not in the government uh, towards the late 70s, he was out of the government, but his influence con you know, continued. And not only his influence continued, the fact that he was able to influence a lot of people who were working with him and around him, that whole, you know, what I call in my chapter, the Kissingerian way of thinking continued for a long time uh, because people who were part of the US foreign policy system, who looked up to him, people he mentored, uh, they were very, part, very much part of the decision making and he himself continued to play some kind of a role. And in fact, 89th Tiananmen Square that Sanjay mentioned, uh, it was interesting to see that uh, you know, both Nixon and Kissinger were, were brought into play uh, when George Bush Sr. was the president to try and figure out some way out with the Chinese. Uh, a lot has been written about Kissinger. Kissinger himself has written a lot. Uh, you know, he's had his point of view. He has tried to you know, state, uh, you know, fend off various allegations and accusations that have been thrown at him, uh, whether it was what was happening in Southeast Asia, you know, the whole Vietnam thing, uh, South America, he had a role to play in a lot of things. But he stood out as somebody who has influenced a lot of things for which we are today, uh, I wouldn't say paying a price, but uh, at least we are impacted. You know, a lot of things that happened in the past impact what's going to happen in the future and that's where we stand and that's where if we, we thought we'd look at it uh, from the point of view of putting things in perspective, uh, looking back at history and seeing how it has impacted us. And thirdly, uh, with a lot of you know, our contributors have talked about, 
what does the future look like? Uh, within this, of course, one has to keep in mind the fact um, that each nation, each geography, each region has its own interest to look after. But from our point of view, at least from my point of view, where the idea came from that, uh, you know, Kissinger is kind of a central theme in a lot of conversations that happen. Uh, and from there, it, the fact that even at 98 years of age, he still is continuing to do a lot of what he has done in the last 50 years uh, is quite an amazing thing. And it's something that needs to be looked at. So that's where the whole idea came from. In my chapter that I've written, I'm, I've talked about uh, two things specifically. One is um, that the Americans got it all wrong. Uh, they were looking at it a lot more from a tactical point of view, but the Chinese being Chinese, where they had a 50 year vision of where things were going to go. And interestingly, uh, you know, the former Singaporean Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew said that in 1993, uh, and I've quoted him in my, in my chapter, the fact that there's something, I mean, there is a China which you cannot, um, you know, overlook. And in 30 years time, you will have to worry very strongly about where China is, what it wants to do. So he said that in 93, so we are almost there 30 years, you know, period that we are looking at. And... Uh, in every conversation that you look at, and I'm, I am, I'm not an academic. Uh, I am, I am more into currently advising very large corporations and businesses, uh, you know, in 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 advocacy, policy, and, and that kind of stuff. And, but even there, from a business point of view, uh, international relations plays an important role because what's happening in the world. Uh, in some part of the world today can impact your business and you're sitting in, in a completely different part of the world. So I think those that was one thing that I've talked about. The other thing I talked about is that, you know, it's uh, the way Chinese played the game, it, it, I mean, it was part naivety on part of the Americans. They could not see what was coming or they did not want to see whatever that happened. Matt, Matt Pottinger, the 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 Deputy National Security Advisor in the Trump administration has just done a long piece in foreign affairs. Uh, and Matt was a colleague in Reuters many years ago. Uh, and he's, he has, and he's been a China expert. And uh, I believe that a lot of what the Trump administration did with China came from him. Uh, and he's also made the same point that uh, I think uh, the Chinese were able to hoodwink and, and create for themselves a scenario and a situation where they just took what I call the Americans for a merry ride. So I'll stop here. I think my time is over. And rather back to you. Yeah, thank you, Rahul. Uh, thank you very much. And now let's move to the uh, three uh, chapter contributors followed by, uh, by me. So let me ask uh, Dr. Tanvi Madan. Uh, Tanvi, you want to take charge? Uh, thank you, Raj, and uh, thank you also to Sanjaya and Rahul for including me in this volume. Uh, it, it pleased both the historian in me and the policy researcher. Uh, my chapter looks at um, the kind of the 250, uh, the, the two events um, that this is the 50th anniversary of. Uh, one is, of course, Kissinger's trip to China, but the other thing that happened, which was very relevant in the subcontinent, uh, was the uh, what was then called the East Pakistan crisis and what we have subsequently called the Bangladesh crisis which went on through the spring of 1971 and culminated in the India-Pakistan war uh, of late in December of 1971. And my chapter looks at the intersection of these events and, and, and you hear resonance of what uh, we're seeing today with Afghanistan, where you find that when major power competition takes place, uh, even regional issues are seen through that prism uh, and both shape and get shaped by that uh, major power competition. Uh, my chapter looks at kind of, it, it looks at the prism through which Nixon and Kissinger saw this crisis playing out in South Asia throughout that year. And I recall um, a conversation that, that, that takes place between Nixon, Kissinger, and Deputy National Security Advisor uh, Alexander Haig to discuss uh, the war. And this was in December when the on, uh, war was ongoing. When Kissinger proposes in a public statement um, saying that we should say that uh, India is the aggressor, and the reason he outlines is, and I quote, he said, to impress the Russians, to scare the Indians, and to take a position with the Chinese. 
And Nixon retorts, and he was very clear about his priority. He said, the Chinese, that's the main thing. And my chapter argues that this China factor on Nixon's minds and Kissinger's led to this kind of extraordinary set of conversations between them during that war, but throughout the year, uh, and in December, they are still talking about, they discussed whether or not Beijing would and should move militarily against India on behalf of Pakistan during that war, what the US should do to deter the Soviet Union from acting against China if Beijing took that step. And you see this point where Nixon asks, even asks Kissinger whether it would require the US to, as he put it, start lobbing nuclear weapons in uh, to shape the outcome of that regional or you could argue even local crisis. Um, and I, that conversation kind of reflects kind of the prism through which since in the course of that entire year, Nixon and Kissinger had seen that developing crisis over uh, East Pakistan, what was later Bangladesh. And their particular concern was that the crisis's potential to scuttle uh, their China rapprochement uh, was grave. Uh, and that in turn, that threat to their China rapprochement, they believed would harm in turn their triangular diplomacy, which was designed to change the balance of power in the US-Soviet-China triangle. Uh, and the idea for them had been for, to give Washington leverage with Moscow that would eventually help bring an end to the Vietnam War, or at least America's involvement in it uh, to an end. Um, and Nixon and Kissinger saw this triangulation. And within that, the required rapprochement with China is crucial, not just for strategic reasons, but for Nixon's 1972 uh, re-election prospects as well. And so my book, my chapter in this book argues, well, there was clearly no love lost between Nixon and Indira Gandhi or her government in India. It was really this China factor that was the crucial determinant of the American approach during that crisis. I also suggest that it is a good bet and historians like me don't try to like to do counterfactual, but I would suggest it's a good bet that the American approach to that crisis that India-Pakistan crisis would have been very different um, had the 1971 Bangladesh crisis not coincided with Nixon and Kissinger's quest for that rapprochement with China. And their triangulation, uh, that priority that they had about triangulation led to uh, the infamous American tilt to Pakistan, which was taking Pakistan's side in this crisis. And it also contributed, I argue, to the Indian tilt to the Soviet Union. Um, moreover, I argue, in terms of the long-term consequences of the, what happened in 1971, these two tilts cast a long shadow with effects that have lasted to this day. Uh, and what you saw kind of a, during the course of 1971 is, what were these kind of tilts? Just very briefly, I'll take a couple of minutes. Um, you saw Nixon and Kissinger seeing Pakistan first as a channel to China. And after a direct line was established uh, with, the, with the Chinese after the Kissinger trip, then Nixon and Kissinger convinced themselves that if they didn't support Pakistan, then Beijing would doubt the credibility of the US as a reliable partner. You will hear echoes again of the conversations we have these days about reliability and credibility. And so you saw them tilt towards Pakistan during this crisis. Lesser known and understood is that India tilted towards the Soviet Union because of this crisis that being combined with this US-China rapprochement. Moscow had proposed a treaty to India two years before. Indira Gandhi had turned it down for a number of reasons. But she saw this imminent war, uh, that there was an imminent India-Pakistan war. Um, and she now saw cons had concern that China would join Pakistan. And potentially, even the US would range up on the side uh, of China and Pakistan. That made her turn to the Soviet Union. And they signed this 1971 treaty uh, that cast kind of a long shadow on not just the uh, India-Russia relationship to this day, uh, but also has created problems, for example, in the US-India relationship. Because because of that treaty, uh, you saw two things happen. One, Indians started to think of the US as unreliable and the Russians as reliable during crisis. And it wiped out the memories of the China-India War of 1962 when Russia was the unreliable country. Second, um, it started this uh, real kind of relationship or really spurred rather than started a defense trade and technology relationship between India and Russia, which means due to path dependence today, an estimates range 50 to 85% of Indian military equipment is of Russian origin. Um, I will say two other things before I end in terms of the sh shadow that we see even today 
uh, of that kind of combination of the Bangladesh crisis and the US-China rapprochement on Kissinger's trip. One is uh, this con Indian persisting concern about what is called the G2. Now, India is not the only Asian country that has this, but this idea that even though today the US sees China competitively, tomorrow you never know uh, an American government will come in, an American administration will come in and say, we need to do business with the Chinese. And that will leave Asian allies and partners in the lurch. And you still see that shadow that I think we've come a long way. But on the other hand, I will say, end with saying that another lesson of this period is, while many in India say that India does not ally or align, um, this whole episode shows that India does align. Uh, when it needs to, it takes very pragmatic decisions. And it's not just the US that plays balance of power games, uh, but India is capable of doing so as well. Thank you. Thank you, Tanvi. Uh, Dr. Siddika, are you there? Can you? Yeah. Hi, welcome. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. Hi. Right. Um, am I am I on? Yes. Yeah. Right. Uh, thank you so much for this invite to speak, and uh, thanks to Sanjay and Rahul for asking me to uh, to contribute a chapter. Uh, what I've looked at uh, is is really a, a Pakistani perspective. Uh, how did uh, how did Henry, Henry Kissinger's outreach to China look like and what impact did it have on, uh, you know, on, on strategic relations between uh, Pakistan and US and Pakistan and China. My argument is that the relations that we see today uh, are actually etched in, in history. Uh, they were made, the bases were, uh, were framed uh, in, in during the 19, late 1960s and 19. Uh, 1970s. That is around Henry Kissinger's visit to uh, visit to China. Uh, very recently, uh, Islamabad has been uh, has been expressing a, a discomfort with being, you know, a, a, a greater pressure being put uh, put on it, uh, you know, in which which almost looks like. Pakistan being asked to decide whether it wants to have uh, better relations with the United States to choose between either US or, or China. Uh, and of course, there is a, a discomfort because of the way relations were framed during the 1970s. 1970s, uh, Pakistan became a major source of uh, a rapprochement between China and, and, and the US. And that was the time when uh, the in India-Pakistan war uh, took place in 1971. That was the time when both United States and China were cooperating, were demanding, uh, you know, uh, demanding from each other and drawing each other's attention towards uh, the state that Pakistan was in. Uh, now, despite that Pakistan and, and uh, the, 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 the fact is that Pakistan lost the war, despite that there was help from China, there was help from the United States, nothing much could be done. Uh, however, uh, it, that, was, that was a time when the, the, the framework, uh, you know, kind of uh, was launched, the framework for a dual relationship uh, in which Pakistan could carry the burden of both uh, relations at the same time, uh, two very different ideologically, two different states, uh, and 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 that balancing act could be done. Uh, so in my chapter, what I've looked at is how over these since 1971, how Pakistan has managed to balance and carry these two uh, fundamentally important bilateral relations and how it has benefited from both. On the US side, uh, you know, it, it's, it's uh, after 1971, I mean, despite that there was a dependency, Pakistan had this dependency on the United States for, for, uh, for support in, 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 in a war that it, it eventually lost. Uh, there was an expectation 
uh, you know, that that could not get fulfilled. However, uh, and, 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 and that resulted, the tension in South Asia uh, resulted in, in freezing of relationship for, for a while, yet it came back after uh, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. And because United States had looked at uh, the region primarily from the perspective of, of, of the Soviet Union, its relationship with the USSR, former USSR, Therefore, uh, Pakistan be did become a beneficiary then and, and, and even later. Uh, Afghanistan had remained and UN and, be and before that, USSR, Afghanistan connected with USSR was how United States looked at Pakistan, uh, a country that would deliver on that count. And for Pakistan, it was a matter of extracting uh, you know, uh, resources, benefits, uh, and 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 that that was the that was a fundamental strengthening of of, of relationship. Um, that we then see breaking, uh, you know, towards the 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 second uh, cooperation. I mean, the the the, the second phase of cooperation. Uh, you know, um, after after nine eleven. 9-11, uh, when Soviet Union is no longer there, we see that there is that Id the, you know, the ideological frame uh, which had strengthened Pakistan-US relations was no longer there. And therefore we see a gradual weakening. Uh, we have always looked at United States-Pakistan relations in terms of convergence and divergence. Uh, now, of course, that, that uh, you know, that perspective is, is, is there. Uh, there, there. There's always that strengthening, very strong relationship whenever there is convergence, and then we see weakening of relationship whenever there is divergence. However, I, I would argue that there is another dimension that needs uh, to be looked at, which is that uh, the, uh, the, the basis on, on which the relationship was framed uh, during the 19, starting from the 1960s, that is Pakistan and uh, United States coming together to fight uh, you know, communism, uh, communist Soviet Union, not communist China, but communist Soviet Union. Uh, United, Soviet Union seen by United States as a primary communist threat. Uh, and 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 so uh, so you know th there is that bonding. There is this ideological ideological bonding. I mean, to uh, Pakistan, uh, a country with 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 an ideological uh, uh, frame, uh, United States also viewed from Islamabad as a Christian country uh, with an ideological frame coming together to fight the Soviet Union. Now that bonding is not there once there is convergence after 9-11. And so we see a substantial weakening. Uh, with China, on the other hand, uh, the, the relations grow from very tactical. I mean, from, from Pakistan's perspective, uh, the emphasis has always been, it had initially uh, always looked at China as a country which is regionally important uh, but it's not strong enough uh, to provide that support that it has always wanted vis-a-vis -vis India. Uh, but tactically, it's significant as, uh, you know, it can fill the gap which, uh, which is created, you know, which is created by wherever the uh, United States cannot help. Uh, my argument is that... Uh, as far as Pakistan-China relations are concerned, they have gradually become more strategic. Uh, with strengthening of China uh, and, and, and redefinition of China's role in, in global politics, um, it's been mu mutually beneficial relationship. Uh, no, it's not just about uh, Pakistan providing uh, an opportunity uh, for, for the China-United States rapprochement. But Pakistan has also tended to fill the, the technological 
very important technological gap wherever China has needed it. In fact, while we look at, uh, you know, why just look at the rapprochement? I think uh, Pakistan in some ways has brought Western technology, American technology to Chinese doorsteps. Uh, that has continued to happen. Uh, it happened throughout the Cold War uh, and it continues to happen uh, even now. It's, it's an important source. Uh, this is the main, and, and, and so, uh, you know, this is a mutually beneficial and relationship in which both states have strengthened each other. Uh, but, uh, you know, 50 years later, uh, the relations are being the bilateral relations, the two bilateral, the chemistry of the two bi bilateral relations is being redefined for Pakistan. Uh, and in this context, in the post, uh, you know, 2010 context, the post Indo-Pacific st uh, strategic reset context, uh, Pakistan is being asked to redefine its relationship, which it finds uh, very un, dis, un uh, very un, it's uh, very uncomfortable to renegotiate. I think it's much more comfortable with the framework which was what was devised in the 1970s. And so the question in Islamabad is why cannot uh, Pakistan have both relationships uh, at the same time? Uh, the problem for it seems to be that American. Uh, excessive focus on the Indo-Pacific in which uh, China is the new enemy and therefore a reframing is to be done. But what Pakistan seems to be offering at the moment is uh, going back to the 1970s framework in which uh, Pakistan actually becomes, uh, you know, becomes a source or becomes a place where Chinese and American interests come together or they can at least negotiate the way they're done in the 1970s. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thank you, Aisha. I think you covered a very, very complex, you know, situation that Pakistan finds itself in. And I think since the visit itself took place through Pakistan, I think but there is a lot uh, to talk about. I'm sure there'll be uh, questions on that. Uh, Ambassador Peter Burgis, uh, it's your turn now. Well, thank you very much, uh, Raja, and thank you for the opportunity to join such a, uh, a distinguished panel. Um, so from an Australian perspective, I, I think the remarkable thing about um, the relationship with China is just how many phases it has gone through as uh, we have tried over time to uh, navigate the sort of geopolitical anxiety of Australia uh, with the economic opportunity that China uh, represents. Um, and Kissinger's opening of, um, of China, uh, you know, marked a clear shift from a perception of threat to a policy of engagement. Although, you know, as a diplomatic footnote, it wasn't Kissinger's opening that um, uh, opened the door for a, a change in Australian policy, because unusually in our diplomatic history, this was actually an initiative taken by the then Australian Labour Party opposition. Uh, its leader was in China actually on the eve of uh, Kissinger's announcement of, uh, of his visit. And uh, our then Prime Minister found himself in the rather embarrassing position of having spent weeks attacking the opposition for daring to go to visit China, uh, only to find that uh, our closest ally had been doing uh, exactly the same thing. Um, the, uh, the engagement framework that um, the post Kissinger visit period opened uh, really went through itself a number of different phases for, for Australia. I mean, I think in the... Um, uh, in, in the 70s, the, up until the 80s, it was essentially building uh, a relationship with a country that we'd had very little to do with, um, recognizing that China was an important part of the region, it was essentially a political relationship. That began to shift for us in the, uh, in the late 80s when 
uh, we came to the view that the uh, reforms that Deng Xiaoping had instituted represented uh, a unique opportunity for Australia from an economic point of view in that uh, we could see that the structural complementarities between our two economies was uh, only going to get larger and indeed to reach an order of magnitude which uh, no one could have imagined in uh, the 60s, the 70s or, uh, or even the 80s. And I know it's fashionable these days to say that we all made a terrible mistake by assuming that China's economic growth um, would create a space for political liberalisation. But I don't think in Australia, at least, um, we ever premised our policy on that assumption. I mean, it may be, it may be the difference between American true believers and Australian sceptics, but... Um, uh, I think most of us felt that uh, China could juggle the inherent contradictions between an opening economy and a very closed political system for uh, a very considerable uh, period of time. Um, my chapter uh, focuses quite a bit on the sort of where to from here with China, because uh, I think that story for Australia of deep economic engagement uh, large returns uh, to our standard of living, uh, relative geopolitical stability is now looking very, very different. And, um, uh, you know, to adapt a, a phrase from the late Tom Wolfe, we are, I think, now facing a bonfire of certainties when it comes to uh, how we deal with, uh, with China. Uh, and so I think the, you know, the, the larger question for countries like Australia is once you stray from a hope for the best engagement, which frankly has been the driving impulse of China policy for the last couple of decades, uh, what do you replace it with? Um, now, you know, we don't see China as an enemy in the classic sense that they have designs on our territory. Um, they're not a strategic competitor of Australia, although they are a strategic competitor of our close ally, the United States. Um, our concern about China is that um, it has fundamentally shifted its position from the days of hide and bide. And the abandonment of hide and bide really opens up uh, a, a policy for China to recreate the Middle Kingdom. And the Middle Kingdom was when hierarchy was harmony, China was at the top of the hierarchy, and, and other, other states uh, preemptively conceded the primacy of China's interests. And it is that what, which worries Australia uh, most about um, a future where China is effectively the predominant power uh, in the region. Uh, and in my, in my chapter, I argue uh, the case for a combination of engagement and constraining China. The engagement case is fairly straightforward and commonsensical. The constraining Ch China is really how do we construct uh, a new strategic equilibrium in the Indo-Pacific uh, that can effectively put a break on China recreating uh, the Middle Kingdom. And uh, uh, I think the Quad is uh, a very important part of the answer to that, uh, because while we can debate endlessly whether China will overtake the US uh, on, on whatever indices you uh, choose to use, uh, what is very clear is that China cannot be more powerful than the aggregate strategic and economic weight of the United States, Japan, India, Australia, and then you can add other countries if they're, if they're so willing. So it's, it's, it's really navigating this new terrain and uh, having in place uh, a framework which is able to define red lines, but more importantly, put the weight uh, of uh, geopolitics and economics uh, 
to, to, to prevent or to deter China from crossing lines of unacceptable behavior, which I think is the, the big challenge for the future. And it's something which in my view will probably take a generation plus to, um, uh, to, to, to agree on and to, and to implement. So I might end there, Raja. Thank you, thank you, Peter. Uh, so, since let me make my brief contribution uh, to the to the panel as a, as one of the contributors to the uh, to the to the book. Uh, I just wanted to highlight the three uh, broad themes uh, uh, that we could uh, look at. One is uh, the sense of that somehow Kissinger was responsible for the American rapprochement with China. I'm not getting into specifically whether the significance of that visit, of course, so much other, so many other things happened. But some of this in India, this sense that somehow Kissinger was the villain of the peace, uh, partly shaped by what happened in 1971 and the Nixon-Kissinger tilt, and later the rapprochement with China, both took place at the, at the, at the same time. Uh, but this idea that Kissinger, the blaming Kissinger or the policies of Nixon-Kissinger policies that they have kind of normalized China, the criticism. Uh, I think that criticism applies to India even more accurately. Nobody did more normalization of China than India. When the US and the West were isolating China in the 1950s, it was Nehru and India that kept going out to the world and say, no, Chinese are good. We can live with them. Let's work together. Chinese must have their seat in the Security Council. Chinese must be brought into the Asian Relations Conference. So it was India that actually argued the case for China uh, and said, look, no, the world must engage China. And of course, the 62, of course, India had a shock from that, uh, the kind of policies that it pursued. But yet India does the same thing in the 1990s. Uh, Post-Cold War, India again joins the Soviet Russia, post-Soviet Russia and China. And the strategy once again becomes, let's moderate American power with the help of China and Russia. Even as the dramatic transformation of China began in the 1990s, Sanjay made this point, it's really the Chinese economic expansion and Deng Xiaoping's southern economic strategy when he goes to the south and says, look, reform must begin, uh, go full steam on reform, and the US capital uh, embraces China. So when China was actually embracing the West in a, in a capitalist sense, and building its capabilities. Here, India was thinking, we will work with the Chinese and the Russians to weaken the United States. So I think uh, India's own policies are, need a lot more reflection uh, that how we are unwilling to be realistic in assessing China and Chinese power. Uh, and I think this is, this is a problem that, that we still, I mean, are still continuing to struggle to come to terms with it. And looking at Kissinger, on the other hand, Kissinger is so different from the mainstream American tradition. And that's why he's so, uh, shall we say, uh, hated, if you will, from a majority of the, the American foreign policy writers. I'm not talking about the, the, the establishment. But the sense that he somehow was, uh, is, brings in a European-style geopolitical tradition to U.S. policy, while the U.S. traditional emphasis on ideology, democracy, uh, Kishore Mabubani has a good point in this book, where he says Kissinger was a pragmatist who brought a sense of power, power politics, to American engagement with China. And I think that served American interests. So the question, I think, uh, for us in India, uh, did we serve our interests? Did our China policy serve India's interests uh, in the 50s? Did it serve our interests in the 1990s? I think those questions that India needs to debate uh, itself. And then again, I think uh, Kissinger was as amenable to doing a deal with India as he was doing a deal with China in 1971. In fact, 1974 visit to India, I think one of the understudied visits, uh, Kissinger was actually open to taking a fresh look at the entire relationship and to rework it. And the, China, and, the, and the Americans were also willing to take India into the nuclear supplies group. But it was Indian ideology, Indian ideological fear of America that was constructed, prevented India from actually finding a way to engage Kissinger, Kissinger in 1974 and to redefine the relationship. Same in 1998. The first person to write an article justifying India's nuclear test was Mr. Henry Kissinger. For him, it was a question of power. Look, India is asserting itself and that we have no fundamental quarrel with India. We can do a deal with India. And that took, of course, another 20 years to actually do that deal. But the fact is, uh, Kissinger's realism actually works for India. And I think we have not uh, fully uh, uh, come to terms with the possibilities in such a kind of realism. 
The second, I think the question that that uh, related uh, theme, which is really India's discomfort with geopolitics, that India's unwillingness to see the world through the lens of power, and much of India's China policy problems, the enduring emphasis on Asian solidarity. Somehow, India had an obligation to work with China. Well, China, it, 18 years after the Korean War, which saw thousands of casualties, was ready to deal with the Chinese. And here Indians were saying, no, there's somehow a fundamental contradiction between India and Asia on the one hand and the West on the other, uh, while Mao had no problems. And Deng even more uh, integrated Chinese economy uh, with, the, with, the, with the Western economy. Uh, I think the same thing applies to how uh, Pakistan dealt with alliances. While Indians are so torn between alliance, autonomy, uh, even today, the debate is endless, continues to rage. Here was Pakistan, part of the Seattle, part of the Cento, but ready to do a deal with the Chinese starting from the 50s, actually uh, beginning with the Asian, you know, the Bandung Conference, where Chavan Lai and Bogra, a PM of Pakistan, found a way to work together. But, but it was India's struggle to come to terms with the real quality. Uh, that I think continues. And if you see Chinese, uh, have they ever objected to US-Pakistan relationship? Have, have they ever said a word about, uh, you know, the, why is Pakistan the most uh, rela- most non-NATO ally? We don't, we, don't, we don't see that from them. So I think for India's own China policy, I think the more realistic approach uh, is and a pragmatic balance of power approach would work much better. Here you know, there are lessons that we could take from, from, uh, from China. Uh, some would argue that, look, India's Indo-Soviet treaty that came within three weeks after Kissinger's visit to China is a symbol of India's geopolitical acumen and that India was ready to respond. But I think it was a tactical move. I mean, I think India fairly quickly backed off from thinking of it as an alliance. Uh, that, in fact, by 81, the 10th anniversary, in fact, India Prime Minister Indira Gandhi was reluctant to go and celebrate the 10th anniversary of the treaty. Uh, she began to diversify the relationship. And once again, the tendency was to, uh, to, to go back to hedging and balancing rather than thinking of it as an alliance that, that you could uh, build upon. Uh, equally, I think part of the problem for India has been the drift towards Soviet Union coincided with a leftward drift within the India's domestic politics, where the ideology of uh, state socialism, um, uh, nationalization, uh, and the left-wing politics, which gripped the Congress party, actually contributed to India's further economic decline uh, in the international system. Uh, that was a period when we famously threw out Coca-Cola and the IBM uh, out, of, out of India. So, and it was a bipartisan uh, consensus. So, so I think till 1970, India was in the top 10 world economy, top member of the top 10 global economies. The decline of the 70s, with the kind of policies that Indira Gandhi pursued domestically uh, is something we're still struggling to undo and, and I think that is a challenge that, that we need to come to uh, terms with. And finally, on the question is, can India really learn something from Kissinger and China? Uh, that is the, the, the virtues of real politics. That when China was benefiting from participating in Western institutions, uh, India was distancing itself continuously from those institutions. When China was not part of those institutions, the ADB, multilateral institutions, UN, India was championing the cause of China rather than making use of the international institutions uh, to, to, to build itself. And I think uh, there, I think we have much more self-examination uh, or self-critic, self-criticism that, that we need to do. And it's only recently, you could argue, uh, that we're beginning to move towards a more a geopolitical approach, uh, which is willing to engage Russia, China, US simultaneously uh, and discarding some of the hesitations of dealing with the West. Those are fairly recent because even under Manmohan Singh government, as uh, Sanjay would uh, confirm, the difficulty that uh, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh had uh, with what was a straightforward open and shut case on the nuclear deal showed how long and how troublesome India's uh, difficult, India's uh, engagement with power politics uh, has been. But some would argue India has finally turned the corner. But I would say, uh, let's wait and watch whether India is still comfortable with being a, a, an actor of as a power player in the international system, or is it going to be torn by self-doubt and uh, in, inherited uh, ideological burdens that it is struggling to discard with? So I'll stop uh, here, and uh, let me uh, 
uh, open up the session for uh, Raj, before you do that yeah sure yeah uh, i just thought i should mention a couple of essays which yeah. i did not in the very beginning uh, both of which are very important essays one is by uh, igor yurgens from russia um, who makes a very simple point that you know kissinger was not particularly smart all he did was when he realized that soviet union and china had uh, fallen apart um, you know he used the classic principle of friends uh, uh, enemy's friend is a friend, and reached out to China because the Soviet Union was the bigger threat. So reaching out to China was a kind of a natural uh, consequence of the split, sino soviet split. The second essay, which is uh, from an Indian perspective and from the point of view of what you've just said, uh, important is Suhasini Haider's essay, um, which looks at the impact for South Asia as a whole of the US-China rapprochement. Because the fact is that, I mean, one can get into a long argument about you know, what are the options that were available to India uh, in the 1970s, for, particularly given its economic and other position at that time. But certainly the fact is that the US-China rapprochement, um, because it privileged Pakistan, and that's the interesting point that Swastin makes. Suppose Kissinger had kind of taken off from Finland, uh, which was available as an option. Uh, and not from <laughs> Islamabad, uh, what would it have meant for uh, the Europe and the Bajan? The fact that Pakistan became central to this rapprochement had consequences for South Asia. So, I mean, India had to deal with that. I mean, uh, whatever our ideological blinkers, the reality was that suddenly our geopolitical environment had been transformed by uh, this one fact. And that is Swasin's essay. So I thought I'll just mention these two which I didn't in the my yeah. Thank you. We have uh, some questions uh, that have already come in and I ask all participants to send in more. Uh, one was uh, a, an interesting question that came right in the beginning, which is, look, uh, is there a way a Kissinger can be flipped? That is, if Kissinger used China to balance Russia, uh, is it, is it, is it uh, possible that the United States can work with Russia uh, to balance uh, China, a rising China? Uh, so in many ways, I mean, this is a constant uh, question. So, uh, Peter, you want to uh, take the question? I mean, you see that's possible at all or the Russia and the China are too close today for anyone to try and separate them? Well, I suppose in, in theory, if you were taking, you know, a classic realist balance of power view, um, you could um, uh, envisage uh, a strategy where uh, Russia is part of a balancing strategy um, against China, but, but the reality I think is that Russia itself sees the need to bring the US down a peg or two uh, as a stronger strategic interest than uh, whatever uh, concerns uh, it continues to have under the waterline in relation to China. I mean, the, the China-Russia relationship is not a natural uh, meeting of strategic minds or strategic interests. Um, quite the contrary, in my view. <clears throat> so there is a very large opportunistic element to what we're seeing in the China-Russia relationship. And, and, and that means that it's not sort of, you know, joined at the hip and therefore could be separated. But at least in the sort of foreseeable future, uh, it's hard to see Russia itself putting a higher priority on balancing China than it does on uh, diminishing uh, US uh, power and US influence would be would be my kind of bottom line conclusion. And do you sit in Washington? I mean, uh, is there, does Russia have any friends in Washington? You know, there is in recent times, and you saw some of this in the Trump administration, people like H.R. McMaster, who is National Security Advisor, Bridge Colby, who helped write the national defense strategy say that the U.S. should, you know, um, at least stabilize relations with Russia with a theory being that, you know, at the, it will prevent it, stall it from, um, you know, uh, uh, getting closer, push it into Chinese arms. Um, and, uh, or, you know, it could actually create a wedge. And of course, this was all music to Delhi's ears, which has been saying that this is what the West should do. I and you've seen some recent articles, Stephen Blank, Charlie Kupchan in Foreign Affairs propose a similar kind of move. I would say though, um, it is worth reading, and I think it's just out, 
a uh, an article by Sergei Radjenko on uh, on why he is skeptical that this would happen. He's a historian of Sino-Soviet relations, and he points out, as many of us who have looked at this diplomatically, that you know. Kissinger has done a great PR job and historians love to uh, read his memoirs because it's the easiest straw man where you say Kissinger said this, well, the documents actually say this. And one of the things you find um, is that, you know, Kissinger and Nixon, and, and I do think it's important to kind of restore Nixon in this story because it was him that actually came up with a lot of these ideas and took the political flack for it. Um, Nixon and Kissinger didn't create a Sino-Soviet split, split or a wedge between the two countries. They took advantage of an existing split uh, the Chinese and Russians almost went to war if actually did have a, kind of a, a conflict in 1969. And uh, this came after that. So they took advantage of something that was already in place. And um, Sergei's article is worth reading in War on the Rocks because it does point out why the situation today is quite different, including in terms of the, the fact that the Sino, so, or the Sino-Russian relationship is not an alliance does not have ideological differences, actually makes it harder to even take advantage of their differences. Um, so there's a lively debate. Um, I am more on Sergei Radchenko's side of this um, because I, I think it's more hope than uh, that many people have that this yeah. will become easier for everybody to tackle China. But I'm skeptical um, that we're gonna see this major split. And timing matters. If a split happens in 10 years, it's still 10 years of all of us having to deal with yeah. the two of them at the very least coordinating We've already seen them coordinating at the UN, uh, but also in the Indian Ocean. They have started exercising together, not just in the Western Pacific, uh, but the Indian Ocean. China is today selling, uh, or Russia today is selling China more advanced equipment than it sold India. So, you know, this is the kind of thing that we are seeing, uh, and I don't see it being reversed anytime soon. So I had a question for Sanjay. I mean, you're the only economist uh, amongst us. That while Kissinger's move tried to take advantage of the geopolitical dynamic that was emerging between Russia and China, the split in the international communist movement. But it was really the Deng, Deng Xiaoping's strategy of changing China's economic orientation. That is building capitalism in China, which actually, and that in partnership with the West, where actually Deng took a position so dramatically opposed to the traditional communist uh, orthodoxy. That really opened the possibilities of actually working with the Americans, where American capital uh, fell in love with China, where they were making money. So without Deng and the China's opening up, uh, the kind of transformation of US-China relationship, would that have been possible at all? And then that's similar to India, that India's own closing of its economy that limited India's possibilities with the US well until the reform era. Uh, would you think these are both the way domestic Economies evolved had a big uh, say on the on the overall politics uh, of Asia. You see, first of all, of course, then created the basis for a new relationship between the capitalist West and communist China. There is no denying that. Uh, there is also no denying that China came has come up uh, with its own bootstraps. Uh, its investment in its education and its infrastructure, uh, and, and therefore the China's rise uh, is, uh, is homegrown. And I don't think anyone can disagree with either of those propositions. But the fact is that when Deng began opening up China, the United States heartily reciprocated. And the, and, and the point I make in my essay, Henry Kissinger actively lobbied the US Congress and successive administrations through successive individuals or members of Kissinger Associates went into government, came out of government over a period of time to extend to China a range of benefits, including you know, membership of the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, access to funds, access to Wall Street, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, you, know, you keep saying, Raja, about India. Look, 91, India changed. We opened up. And how much American investment came in? How much Japanese investment came? I know 91 to 97, I was in Delhi as a business journalist. We would meet, you know, American after American delegation, Japanese after Japanese delegation, everybody, you know, giving lectures to India. But nobody investing in India. But we had opened up. We had reduced our tariffs. We had made FDI open. You know, you talk about kiss, throwing IBM and uh, Coca-Cola out. That was 1977. In 91, we opened up. And yet it took 10 years 
for India to be able to become attractive to these countries. So th th there are other factors operating uh, in these countries, with, apart from the fact that you know, in China, of course, Deng Xiaoping made China more attractive to Western capital, but Narsimha Rao made <laughs> India more attractive to Western capital. And, and yet it took a long time because I think the geopolitical factors uh, were not, uh, you know, adequately attractive for what we just said a little while back. Yeah, India was not as an, an easy uh, country to deal with. But also I think the fact is that um, the, 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 there was no India lobby in the US till we created it after 98. I mean, you know, you and I were, were part of the process that created an India lobby through the India-US strategic dialogue that the Confederation of Indian Industry, the US Chamber of Commerce, you know, from 90, what, 97, 90, uh, onwards, both of us were actively involved in lobbying the US to you know, bring more investment into India. And it took uh, some time for uh, American business to actually come to India. So, thanks, Sanjay. San Tanvi, there is a question for you specifically, uh, which says, uh, uh, you know, you've seen the US-China relationship has changed, are uh, changing. Uh, the question is, how do you see the U.S.-China Cold War coming to an end? I mean, are we just at the beginning? Is it really, is it even possible to imagine today that, that you can uh, reduce the conflict and uh, end the Cold War, the incipient Cold War between U.S. and China? That's the question addressed to you. So, you know, I kind of share the skepticism of those who say, look, we can't call this a new Cold War partly because of how different things are on the economic side, I prefer to use kind of major power competition. If you want to use great power competition, that works too. Um, I do think though that, that the Cold War can offer us some lessons. And I think this volume shows that. And if you read each of the chapters, you will be struck by some of the kind of, things will sound, as they say, history doesn't necessarily repeat itself, it rhymes. And I think you will hear some of those rhymes as you read this volume. And I think kind of one of the one of the aspects of, of when you see the when you read these chapters or read anything about the Cold War is um, it you know you can't clap with one hand. This was both countries seeing each other as competitors, and I would argue that's the case today as well. You see a lot of audiences kind of often blaming the U.S., saying the U.S. is making this a competition. Uh, the U.S. is kind of you know sees this as a competitive, but. It's not just happening on one side. China sees this competitively as well. And as Ambassador Baghi's pointed out, um, it is some of their actions that is causing this competition. So, you know, we, th th we're not going to see, and we shouldn't want to see it end with a bang um, in, in terms of the Cold War. I think this is going to be a long-term kind of effort, all things being equal, you know, not seeing some sudden collapse uh, here or there of any regimes. Uh, but I think, you know, we're in this for kind of the long haul. Um, China sees itself as uh, big and uh, powerful. And as most countries that got that powerful historically, including with a self-image as a re-emerging power, uh, as India does, when you have that image kind of uh, combined with uh, the power and capability, you want to set the rules in your own and you expect um, uh, to set the rules in your own area. For China, the issue is it is not the only uh, kind of, it might be the, the one, you know, incipient superpower, but there are a lot of other powers in the region, you want to call the middle power, major powers, uh, that because of the balance of power uh, you mentioned, to, to kind of have that shape, that favorable balance of power will work with the US as well in this competition, even if you know various countries don't have strategic competition to itself. So I think we're in this for the long haul. I can't predict um, how, uh, you know, this ends. Um, I think there's the economic dimension, which is important. After all, one has to remember that the Soviet Union collapsed under having to spend a lot of money on the military, but fundamentally was their economic resources ran out, including for their people, which undermined their very kind of ideology, something the Chinese are extremely conscious of, which is why uh, they pay so much attention to ensuring that their citizens think that they are delivering. So I think we're in this for the long haul. I can't predict uh, how it ends, but I think we should see this as a more complex competition, which is with countries that interact uh, quite, um, quite uh, will, will compete even as they 
uh, e even if not cooperate as they kind of interact with each other on, on areas of importance. But I don't also see a G2 developing. I think things have gone too far in the US for that or, and, in, and in Beijing. Roger, could I just add um, yeah, sure. yeah. one comment there? I mean, the easiest way to end it, the Cold War is not to start it. And I, I actually don't accept that we are now uh, in the midst of a full-blown Cold War vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. Um, I mean, the reality is that policies are in a state of flux at the moment. I suspect they're in a state of flux more on the US side than they may be on the Chinese side. But the measure of a Cold War is a, rad a radical decoupling uh, of what is a globally integrated economic system. And I don't see that at the moment. And I think we do have an opportunity to prevent it from happening. Um, so, you know, it's um, a mistake in my view to just assume that this is inevitably the path that we're heading. I mean, this is a path that can be changed through policy choices. And it would be, you know, unfortunate if we sort of sleepwalked into it because we had convinced ourselves there was no alternative. Questions uh, that has come up in the chat is really I mean, a couple of them actually. Uh, on the on this question of uh, you know China's Belt and Road Initiative, which is kind of the most uh, emblematic of China's rise, its capacity it's of Chinese capitalism to invest abroad, to undertake gigantic projects, uh, and now the the G7, the Quad uh, are all talking about providing some kind of an alternative. Uh, whether it was the Blue Dot Network that Australia, Japan, and the US talked about, or now the American. Uh, build back better program or the more recently the quad in relation to vaccines uh, is there any comments on this i mean is it really a credible thing or really a coalition cannot really match uh, the purposefulness of uh, china's uh, dramatic economic uh, infrastructure and other uh, initiatives shall we start with you peter that i'll go to everyone i mean uh, on this Look, I, I think the objective here is to give countries choices. I mean, if, uh, if you see the BRI as uh, some uh, large geopolitical play, which in many respects it is, um, the way to try and deal with that is uh, to make sure that there are some viable choices available to countries who would otherwise be uh, left with the only option of signing on to BRI. Now, um, we're starting with a very unequal playing field in that I think the resources that BR BRI can throw at these issues is uh, substantially greater than uh, the combined resources so far, at least, of the various sort of sub-initiatives that we've seen, um, some, of which, uh, some of which you mentioned. Um, but, you know, I, I don't... I think we should sort of approach this at, at, at a number of different levels. Uh, part of it is um, looking at the, the, the sort of level of uh, transparency and political traps that are built into BRI. Part of it is an investment on the part of uh, countries like the US and Japan and Australia and India and others uh, in infrastructure projects in uh, in the region, so you know, I don't, I, I don't think it's 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 a question of the BRI has this sort of inescapable momentum that will take all before it. You, you know, you've been you know reflect on the CPEC, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which is one of the central elements of the BRI. Now, this talk about extending it to Afghanistan, it relates to some of the uh, themes that you had developed in your chapter and your presentation. So, is there any thoughts you have in terms of? how this infrastructure race might play out. Aisha? Sorry. Yeah. Um, before I respond to this, this question on, on CPEC and BRI, I think there's, there's one other point which I wanted to make. I'd send a message to, uh, to Raja. You probably didn't see it. Uh, you know, this was, this was regarding uh, Russia, China. Um, and I think when we look at, uh, so, so, you know, let, let me finish with that comment first. Uh, I think when we look at Russia, China, and the question of whether there's a possibility of cooperation between Russia and China, there are two ways of looking at it. 
I mean, what kind of, uh, you know, what kind of cooperation can Russia and China see? Uh, is it, I mean, can, can they be joined at the hip? Uh, is it difficult or is it, is it easy for them to do that? And, and, and the problem's there. But then there is being joined at the hip or the perception of China and Russia possibly getting joined in the hip seen from South Asia itself. Uh, that's also another angle that we cannot ignore. And I'm, I'm specifically looking at how Pakistan, for example, has been perceiving the Russia-China relationship uh, for some time. Uh, it sees Russia and China, the possibility of the two coming together. Uh, and in, in, in a partnership, it, it sees itself in a partnership with, with Russia and China. Uh, so from that angle, the two countries uh, can come together. Uh, there is tactically, there is this cooperation, uh, the, the development, the defense development projects uh, that Pakistan has undertaken with China uh, include Russia as well. Uh, the JF-17 Thunder aircraft use Russian, uh, you know, uh, Russian engines. It's, it's a very interesting cooperative relationship. And that's what Pakistan has been pushing uh, domestically as a possibility. Uh, and, I, and I know that this, this relationship is not considered serious. I mean, there, there, there is a, a different dimension through which it's seen in, in both India and in and, and Washington. But in Pakistan, uh, the cooperative relationship is very much a possibility. So, you know, just, just want to, uh, you know, uh, just, just want to put that on record. Uh, you know, as far as CPEC and, and, and BRI con is, uh, are concerned, uh, at this point in time in the region, there is nothing else happening. Uh, I mean, we constantly hear about Indo-Pacific, but Indo-Pacific is not actually physically happening while CPEC is, while BRI is. Uh, I mean, that is an important reality. Uh, now, from, from uh, I think at one level, CPEC got... Uh, stalled, uh, you know, it got slowed down uh, to a large extent because of Pakistan wanting to balance its relationship with United States uh, and China at the same time. It doesn't want to be too eager to jump in uh, to the Chinese camp. It does not want to commit itself uh, entirely to the Chinese camp. I mean, the two models that we see in South Asia itself, one is China's relationship with Sri Lanka, uh, you know, where, where the greater pressure on, on the recipient state. And then there is Pakistan, which uh, has much more, the, the relationship, bilateral relationship around CPEC has a lot more play than what you'd find in say China, Africa or, or China, uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, and and, and, and it's, it's really a matter of, of how different states are negotiating CPEC and BRI, but they see it as uh, essentially beneficial. Uh, they essentially see it as, as China's greater capacity to deliver uh, uh, you know, development, which right now no other uh, state, no other big power can do. Uh, you know, America uh, definitely has, I mean, there's a big question mark around what Indo-Pacific strategy or Indo-Pacific frame can deliver uh, to the region and to states. I mean, briefly, now we're beginning to run against the clock on the, on the infrastructure, BRI, you know, build back better. Uh, you're asking me? Sorry. Just... Well, very quickly, because I also am uh, running after... Oh, yeah, yeah, I... sure. Uh, you know, in fact, it's very interesting what Peter said. Who has the money? China has the money. You know, I mean, Japan and India have this uh, partnership for quality uh, infrastructure, PQI, and we are doing something with that. But if you look at the, the foundation of BRI, 
is China surpluses. And where, how has China garnered those surpluses? By becoming the manufacturing factory of the world and exporting the su trading superpower. And who are they exporting to? They're exporting to the rest of the world. So, you know, it's a, it's a circular relationship. So BRI was made possible by the fact that the rest of the world was willing to buy more from China than China was buying from them. No, you had to you had to leave. So thanks again and congratulations on this book. So before I wrap up, but let me go back to uh, Tanvi. Uh, Tanvi, you, have you had anything to say on this? I mean, um, so you know, I, think, I think Ambassador Vaghi said what I think is important, which is I think the countries at the end of the day have to offer alternatives. For one, I think the second there are ways to offer technical assistance to write, pick, you know, recognizing that countries aren't going to, even if you take a US or a Japanese option, you're not going to give up your, your kind of alter China alternative, because if you're a government in South, Southeast Asia, in Pakistan, in Africa, at the end of the day, you see the Chinese coming, bringing in, and I would emphasize as much of this is not grants, it's loans, but they're bringing in capital and they're building things really quickly, especially if you are kind of trying to answer to your your public uh, and elections are coming up, um, that's a useful uh, option to have. And so I think, you know, what, what countries can do along with giving alternatives. And I would say, while we say, you know, the, the Chinese are doing all this, the Japanese are doing uh, uh, quite a bit as well. And so if you look at the numbers, they're quite competitive in terms of what they're doing. They just don't package it this way and say, you know, the quality infrastructure uh, uh, initiative they had wasn't quite packaged in the same way. But the second thing is, you know, so alternatives, I would say technical assistance, write better contracts. We saw the U.S. did this, do this with Myanmar and the port of Shokpyo and that development. Um, also kind of, I would say, finding ways to highlight, uh, to push for transparency, to highlight downsides of existing uh, Chinese contracts, particularly those that do these debt for equity sw swaps and have those built in, um, you know, asking the questions if these contracts are so good, why does China put into these contracts that they are uh, that they're not to be revealed to countries, uh, to governments, publics? Um, so I think there's a lot that can be done. I still am trying to figure out what the Build Back with Better World is. I do think it's important for kind of G7 countries uh, and the Quad countries to understand that, you know, these big things won't matter. People will want to see what you're bringing uh, to the table, I would have preferred, for example, that that kind of speech was not given at a G7 meeting, uh, but was given kind of in the region, if you're going to say that that's what you're targeting. Ask people, you know, the complaint is that China is kind of, this is a supply-driven initiative. So ask countries in the region what they want. Um, and, and, you know, in some cases deliver it, but in other cases, I also don't think should get into a race to the bottom where you're building white elephants, like, you know, a Hamman Tota airport that nobody's going to use, uh, it will just lead uh, to kind of countries going into uh, insolvency at some point, or, or at least, you know, have a lot of debt on their books that they don't need. So I think uh, need to approach this with kind of some uh, nuance, which is what are the projects that are of real concern? Um, so for example, for the Quad, I would say assess, are there projects that are going to have strategic implications, uh, potentially military implications? And in that case, get together and coordinate, whether it's alone, whether it is in coordination, an alternative. Uh, but, you know, if China's building a road that everybody can use and it's not putting a country into debt, I don't think that in itself is a bad thing. Rahul, uh, you wanted to add something? I mean, uh, this? Are you there? Yeah, no, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, no, I, think, I think, you know, the... Uh, I, I at one point in time I, I lived in Sri Lanka you know, at the peak of the war and I used to see the nice Indian Ocean, you know. And I went some years back and there is no ocean, there's no water. It's only sort of taken over by the land that Chinese companies have claimed. But I think you know the point that can be made and and, and Peter made a it that you know eventually the countries have to make a choice. Uh, it is on them. Uh, you have uh, ruling dispensations which are obviously looking to ensure that you know the right kind of infrastructure is built, people are happy, and they will make those choices. Yeah, the difficult part, of course, is that what it does to the whole geostrategic situation in the, in the neighborhood. So, for example, if you look at what the Chinese have done in Sri Lanka, there's obviously a concern for India over there. What's happening in Bangladesh or Myanmar is obviously a concern for India. But I think eventually who has the money matters. 
I mean, if you're looking at the United States today, they are talking about investing a trillion dollars, creating their own infrastructure domestically. They are not going to go out and give money to some people who want to build roads. Absolutely not. And this is where I think China has managed to score well. Uh, there have been ups and downs and dips, but at the end of the day, you know, every nation's got to make a choice. And if China is offering them a choice that is acceptable to them, that's what's good to be. You know, I'm now we're almost uh, at the end of time. So I just want to ask each one of you just for a short one sentence or two sentence uh, answer. Uh, Rahul, if you look looking towards uh, the, you know, China, uh, China, US, India relationship, is this one thing you think the most important thing that, that we need to keep an eye on? Uh, you know, I always believe we don't choose our neighbors uh, and we have to learn with our neighbors. So, you know, uh, China is a neighbor, United States is not. Okay. Near term power. So either you bandwagon yeah. the near term, near, near against far or you balance the near balance. by the far. Yeah. So I think yeah. it's, uh, that's, safe. that's what the Chinese use that frame. Uh, to deal with uh, Soviet threat. Uh, Soviet threat, yeah. 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 Tanvi, you, you had one one important thing you think our audience or friends, we, we need to keep an eye out whether it's uh, on the US-China relationship and what it means for us. Um, I think, you know, the, and this goes back to what we were discussing earlier, which is how much of this gets locked in and how much do you actually, in terms of US-China competition, do you start to see kind of real structural decisions being made that isn't kind of total decoupling, but will shape um, the choices that get made down the line? So are you going to start to see some of these medium to long-term decisions being made um, that will kind of disentangle at the very least some of um, the entanglements that all three countries have had uh, over the last 20, 30, 40 years, 50 years, I guess, at this point too, um, and if we start to see that, I think you will see this uh, competition harden. And then I think the task for policymakers is to manage that competition. Um, but I think the signs you have to see is, are we kind of hard, are these decisions getting hardwired? Sure. I mean, you know that the, you know, Kissinger Strip from Pakistan, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Northwestern subcontinent have been the crucible of much of the geopolitics in the last uh, half a century. Let's see if you, given what is happening today in Afghanistan, what is your uh, prognosis in terms of how this is going to affect the US-China relationship and how it might affect Pakistan and the subcontinent? Long question, but can you give a very brief uh, assessment of what we need to be looking for? I mean, I would say that this is a moment in which uh, the regional states need to come together and think about a strategy. How do you deal with, with Afghanistan? Uh, I wouldn't want to see one country in the entire region standing up and saying, oh, we are the winners. We, we got it all in Afghanistan. It has to be uh, a coming together of, 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 of the region. Uh, and, and, and I would see that, I mean, I think there are greater benefits here. Uh, I think even, even, even with, a, with, a, with a US-China relationship, I think Afghanistan could have been handled much better had U.S. not focused too much on, 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 on its rivalry with China and thought about co a cooperative framework there. Uh, so if it's not happened between U.S. and China, why can't it happen between China, Pakistan and India? Now, you, you'll have the last word on this. I mean, you, you've seen... Uh how Asia has transformed under the US-China uh, cooperation. Now, uh, much of the region is uh, shuddering at the thought of uh, US-China breakup. So looking, looking ahead, I mean, where do you, what do you see the chance of Asia managing this, uh, this new conflict between US and China that is beginning to unfold? Well, I think we, we all just have to manage it because we don't have the choice of not managing it. I mean, China is not going away. The Chinese Communist Party is not going away. We're going to have to deal with the world as we, as we see it. And um, uh, I think the only way in which um, the region can deal with this and indeed uh, the world more broadly is to have uh, a framework which recognizes the imperative of engaging with China um, 
where it matters and it's where and where it's in our mutual interests, but also recognizing that um, we do need to find a means of ensuring that behavior which is unacceptable or beyond the pale has some prospect of being either deterred or prevented. Uh, and that's why I think that constraining element vis-a-vis -vis China has to be as important a part of how Asia manages it as uh, you know, the obvious need to uh, also engage with China. It's a wise note on which to bring this discussion to close. Uh, I just want to conclude by uh, thanking all of panelists uh, for, for being with us today. I want to congratulate uh, Sanjay and uh, Rahul for actually putting this uh, volume together uh, and for all the contributions by the various panelists here uh, to, the, to the book. And I think the, the book, I think, sets a, uh, you know, an important trend, I think, in South Asia. Uh, we've not adequately addressed our own past. Uh, that is, uh, those now 75 years, we're celebrating the 75th year of independence. I think the time has come for scholarship, for policy research, to reflect on you know, historicizing our experience of the last 75 years of our international relations, our engagement with the world, uh, rather than let them be decided purely by current political disputes that exist domestically or between countries, and that we need to think more uh, about the past, the way we've dealt with the world. And there are, you know, you can't undo the past, nor you can, uh, you know, reverse it. But, but I think what we can do is to learn lessons from the past and, and to make sure that at least some of the tragedies that could have been avoided in the past, that we don't repeat them. Because uh, this time around, I think uh, if the Cold War uh, was between US and Russia that was focused on uh, Europe, largely and Northeast Asia. Uh, this time, we're going to be quite in the center because we are neighbors of China. So any conflict between US and China uh, is going to affect us and our region uh, far more directly, far more intensely than the uh, the US-Soviet Cold War. So I think we need to engage with this uh, far more vigorously. So I would say this is a good contribution the book uh, to, to that discourse. And uh, we hope to uh, see you all again. And thank you uh, for joining us. And I want to thank all my ISAS colleagues uh, for, for putting this uh, discussion together. Thank you and have a good day, uh, all of you. Thank you, Raja. And thank you, everybody, for joining. Bye. And thank you for contributing to the book. Thank you. Thanks so Bye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Bye. If you're interested in purchasing a copy of the book, you can scan the QR code here or visit the link above. Thank you.